2020 was quite the year. However, a silver lining to everything was that I found plenty of time and an actual desire to read. I read 11 books in 2019, but I knew that I could do better. I set a lofty goal for myself, 20 books in 2020, but as long as I read more than I did last year, I would be happy. This year I finished 17 books. In my opinion, Cormac McCarthy is the finest living author of our time and probably my favorite writer. Outer Dark is not his finest work. It's almost too bleak, even by his southern gothic standards, and the story itself did not lure me in like those of Anton Chigurh or Judge Holden. Outer Dark may never leave my shelf again. However, this novel is a testament to the power of practice, of writing and writing and writing until you pin something good. Outer Dark is only McCarthy's second novel. Without it, Blood Meridian, The Road, No Country for Old Men, and All the Pretty Horses would not be the masterpieces that he eventually produced. I wouldn't recommend this book, but I'm glad that it exists. Pretty soon I'll crack open my unread copies of Setri and Child of God, and I'll be thankful that Outer Dark paved the way. It took a second reading for me to really appreciate The Sun Also Rises. I read it a few years ago, but when I picked it up this time I had forgotten everything but the bulls. This time, the story genuinely made me feel the sorrows of the lost generation. I was trapped in a foreign place full of wine and parties and wine and dwindling bank accounts and wine and disillusionment, all captured so freely and fully in Hemingway's beautiful style. It's a great book, and someday I will read it once again. The Great Divorce was my first foray into C.S. Lewis's theological and philosophical works. It's a pleasant and powerful allegory, and it provides a digestible introduction to everything else Lewis has written not named The Chronicles of Narnia. I was left with lots to think about and an eagerness to dig into the rest of his writings. For better or for worse, most of the books I've read lately haven't really demanded for me to think very deeply. And then I read The Abolition of Man. I did not understand most of what Lewis was saying this first read through. I had to slowly focus on the writing to try and comprehend it, but the few things I did understand were insightful and wise, making me reconsider how education really works. There will be a lot more for me to learn by opening it up again. The Fellowship of the Ring is a great book, but it was not my most enjoyable read. That was not the case with The Two Towers, I absolutely loved this one. I was completely entranced in the first half, and honestly, when the story returned to Frodo and Sam in part two, I just wanted to go back and keep running around with Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. It's been years and years since I fell in love with The Hobbit, and that love was forgotten over time. The Two Towers helped me find that feeling for fantasy once again. The Return of the King is the most fitting conclusion to a series I can think of. As I opened up this final book, I got the same thrill I had as a kid when I reached The Last Olympian or finally started turning the pages of the Deathly Hallows. Return of the King and The Lord of the Rings as a whole is perfect in every way, and classics like these are the reason I have slowly fallen back in love with reading. Yes. 1984 is by all definitions a classic, and its themes and message ring louder and louder as it ages. The thing about 1984, though, is that I didn't expect it to be as enjoyable, even as funny, as it was. It's certainly a dark story and the most iconic dystopia ever put to paper. And yet, in the novel's most human moments, there was a slight humor in it. And that's the beautiful thing about Orwell's work. He truly captures what humanity looks like, both at its most compassionate and at its most authoritarian. Continuing on my super fun dystopia train, I decided to reread Brave New World. I definitely understood and enjoyed the book more this time, but what really makes it worth reading is how scarily prophetic the writing is. Huxley depicts the future as one of leisure and luxury, at least for those selected to enjoy it unquestioningly. And now, almost 90 years after its first printing, it's chilling to see that vision come true. While the prose isn't perfect, it is worth discussing. But unfortunately for Huxley, Brave New World will always be overshadowed by its little brother, 1984. The thing I've realized about John Krakauer's books is that, no matter the subject, I'm going to enjoy it. I didn't plan on reading a story about murderous fundamentalist Mormons this year, but after my aunt's recommendation, I had to read it. 
What sets him apart is his incredible method of alternating the main story with the fascinating history of the subject. Under the Banner of Heaven showcases just that. The story of the murder in question is intriguing, but if I didn't simultaneously receive a thorough understanding of the dark origins and history of the Church of Latter-day Saints, Under the Banner of Heaven would be just another true crime novel. Thankfully, it's different. I did not enjoy reading We Have Always Lived in the Castle, but that is a testament to Shirley Jackson's incredible writing prowess. I dislike Constance from the start, but Jackson's ability to craft a devious and dislikable protagonist while keeping the story suspenseful and interesting made this book a very dark and very engaging read. In a year full of reading books about the many faces of the human spirit, Man's Search for Meaning stands out. It's a testimony of the most infamous atrocity mankind has inflicted upon itself. But it also shows how the will to live, the search for a purpose, can conquer even the most heinous of evils and carry a man to freedom. Frankel is living proof of the importance of purpose, and his story's impact will be felt for generations. I didn't intend to read Blink this year, but as I packed my bags to go isolate with COVID, I made a snap decision and threw it in there. Well, turns out snap decisions are what the book is all about. I learned so much about how the mind makes judgments and assumptions in a fraction of a second, in some cases with devastating consequences. I had to really ask myself, when have I let my first impressions affect my conclusions? Blink is not hard science or a peer-reviewed psych study, but it is enjoyable and interesting and got me through some very long and miserable sick days. Dogs witness every moment of our day, so looking back at my dog's lives is a way for me to see how I have grown up. From my childhood, through high school, and as I packed for college, my dogs sat by my side. They're the best part of coming home and the hardest thing to leave behind. They've never spoken a word, and yet I love them deeply. The art of racing in the rain took me inside the mind of man's best friend, and I finally heard everything dogs wish they could say. Garth Stein's tale of destiny and persistence through the eyes of Enzo is full of soaring highs and devastating lows, culminating in a peaceful, infuriating, moving, sorrowful, and absolutely superb book. Reading this and following it by watching the Cine documentary is a fine combination, like pancakes washed down by hot coffee. That which we manifest is before us. The car goes where your eyes go. Ending the year with Humble Pie was a nice chaser for the heavy and not quite as humorous East of Eden. It's witty and informative and honestly captures what I love about math. The universe's celestial laws and physical relationships are just amazing to see inscribed as Greek and Arabic symbols, and Humble Pie does a fine job at portraying math as enjoyable and even comical. But Matt Parker does not shy away from the deadly and disastrous consequences suffered as a result of lousy calculus. Do your time tables, kids, and please read Humble Pie. It is by far the most enjoyable math book I've read. The Clutters were a nice family. Good neighbors, a cornerstone of Holcomb, Kansas. Sherman Capote introduced them to me, let me spend some time with them. And then they were brutally murdered. In Cold Blood deserves all its praise. The writing is absolutely incredible. The hunt for the killers is detailed and engaging. And when Capote finally drew me in after a slow start, I could hardly put it down. Is it completely accurate? I'm not sure. But is it a truly great work? Absolutely. At the end of the year, I decided to really challenge myself. I rarely read, let alone finish, anything longer than 300 pages. East of Eden is twice that, and I finished it in just one month. Maybe it was Blink that inspired me to go with my gut and pick it up, but I was undaunted by its size and cracked it open. After putting it down, I can say that this is John Steinbeck's masterpiece, his Statue of David. To me, it's a lot like A Hundred Years of Solitude. The generational storytelling, the embodiments of good and evil, the difficulties dealing with produce, the deep and enraging and beautiful story. Sam Hamilton, Lee, even Cal Trask are some of my favorite characters from any novel, let alone from Steinbeck's fantastic collection. I love Steinbeck. I'm so glad that I read East of Eden, and I think I will get a lot more out of it if I reread it in my 40s. Back in January, before society fell apart, 
I started the year off right. Anything Air was bar none the best reading experience I've had in a long, long time. I had no idea what was in store for me when I ignored my giant stack of books I had planned to read next and just pulled this off my shelf instead. John Krakauer's heartbreaking and incredible first-hand account of May 10, 1996, coupled with the history of Everest and the stories of the Mountaineers left me saying just one more page, just one more chapter. Nothing else I've ever read gives me that same rush, that frisson for adventure, as Krakauer's magnum opus. The Two Towers came close, but Into Thin Air was absolutely my favorite book of the year. At the end of my last book report, I talked about how I missed my goal, but I started to build reading into a good daily habit. 17 books. 17 books. That's hundreds of pages more than 2019. Each time I opened a book, I was greeted with interesting stories, different perspectives, and some truly beautiful writing. I'm excited for the things that I'll read in 2021. The next dissertation that makes me think deeply, the next paperback that captivates me, and the next book that I really fall in love with.